here to talk to you about Landgraf. What it is, why it's become, in my opinion, one of the best agent building frameworks recently, and then how we can use it to build an appointment booking AI and display it in a Streamlit web GUI. Right, let's get stuck in. This is what we're gonna build. It's a Streamlit web GUI where we've got chat on the left-hand side, and then we can see the appointments as they get booked on the right-hand side. That's all it does. You can book an appointment, you can check the next available appointment, and then you can cancel the appointment. So let's give it a test. Telling it I want to see my GP. Great, I've told it to be super polite, which is why it's using things like my utmost pleasure. <laughs> so the next appointment is at the 23rd, that is today in one minute. I bet it's best be fast. But yeah, let's go ahead and book it. And we should see, here we go, the appointment is now appeared in our calendar. Great, and now let's cancel it and it should disappear. And there we have it. Let's take a review of what Langraph is and then get stuck into the code. Now, what I like about Langraph is it is not explicitly an agent building framework. It's been designed as kind of a higher order programming language to represent even more complex tasks. So first let's try and understand what graphs are and then we can get into how that relates to Langraph. Your basic kind of graph is this. You've got nodes and edges. Your nodes typically represent objects or things, or entities, and your edges represent relationships between them. Um, this doesn't have to be a flow, it could just be a, a relationship. So in this example, there are cities on the nodes and motorways on the relationships. We can take a step up from that and we can have a graph with, edge, with directed edges. And this type of graph is a directed acyclic graph where there's a one-way flow from left to right, step after step, and there's no way of getting back to the start. Once you've started, you flow all the way to the finish. Great, now what if we introduce cycles? That is now a direct acyclic graph. And the example here is the, the water cycle where it goes round and round forever. The water evaporates from the sea, turns into clouds, rains back into the sea. Uh, that can be represented as a direct acyclic graph. Now what if we want to represent a process or a process or a task? we can use something called a control flow graph. And that represents an execution starting with an input, going through the process and then reaching some output. In this example, we're representing by finding something in the shop that you want to buy. You've only got one pound in your pocket, so that's the input, one pound. And a process you might follow is you might try and find something that you like, check the price, can you afford it? If you can, then buy it. If you can't, then try and look for another item. So now I know what you might be thinking, that isn't that just a programming language? Well, yes it is, Python is a graph. And so this brings about a topic which I call graphception, which is higher and higher order graphs all built on top of each other to increase our ease of use and our ability to represent more and more abstract concepts. On the lowest level, we've got logic gates, which are a graph. On top of that, we've got low level programming languages like assembly code, which are graphs. On top of them, we use high level programming languages like C, which are graphs. On top of that, we use Python, which is a more abstract programming language, but still a graph. And now we're using Langraph, which is, as the name suggests, a graph. So how does this work in practice with what we're gonna, what we're gonna build? Here's, here's a more concrete example, uh, where your input will be the user asking to book an appointment your first node is going to be your language model with a prompt. So it will use the prompt to decide on if it needs to use any tools. Cause we've already told by this point, the language model that has these tool tools it can use. So if it decides to use the tools and that's what it, what it tells us to do, we can then go and execute those functions in code to, for instance, get the next available appointment. That message is then passed back to the language model and it can decide, okay, if that's the next available appointment, what do I need to tell the user? And so in this case, it's responded, the next available appointments on the 19th of March at 9.30, would you like me to book it? And so it's got an awareness of what tools it can use, how it can use them, and it can get information back from these tools in these tool messages. So that's what's happening here. And it could be in some systems that it goes around this circle multiple times, multiple times and uses different tools and keeps trying to arrive at an answer and before it finally decides it's ready to respond to the user. Right then, let's take a look at the code and get stuck in.
Right, so let's take a look at the code. We've got three files. We've got a file to contain all of the tools that the agent's going to need to use. We've got a streamlet front end, which I'm not going to go into too much detail on because I want to focus on Langgraph here. And then we've got the code for the Langgraph application. Let's take a look at the tools first. As we saw in the diagram before, we've got three tools for getting the next available appointment, booking an appointment, and cancelling an appointment. And we tell Langgraph that it's a tool with this at tool handle. Now, the language model gets to see every part of this. So it will see the function name, the function handle, the doc string, and then the response coming out of the function as well. So it's really important that we make it easy for the language model to understand what it needs to do with sensible tool names and a descriptive doc string. What I find really helps as well is keeping these arguments as simple as possible. And I tend to try and use base types. And I think there is only a limited number of types that are supported. But the simpler you can make it, the easier it's going to be for the language model to use the tool. And also it's important to include the output information in a way that the language model can understand. So we're telling it explicitly that one appointment is available at this time in text, which we know language models are best at understanding. So these are our these are our tools. We I'm just assuming that the next available appointment is immediately. That's probably not the case, but it works for this for this demonstration. When we book it, it will just check if that appointment already exists in the calendar. If it does, then it will tell us it's already booked. If it doesn't, then it will add it to the list and say that it's booked. And for cancelling, it does a similar thing. It tries to remove it, but if it can't find the appointment in that time, then it will just say no appointment found at that time. So you can be quite creative with the messages in terms of telling the language model what has happened and whether or not it's been successful or not. And then let the language model manage those errors and decide what to do next, which makes it really... Which makes it work really well in practice because if one of your functions breaks or there's an external API call that can't be reached, your language model will see that and it can respond appropriately either by retrying the call or by presenting that information in a sensible way to the user. So it's, this is a really important part of any agent-based AI system. Right, let's have a look at how we build the graph. Starting at the top, we build our language model. In this case, we're using GPT-40 because it's the best at the moment. Uh, we're storing our conversation just as a list. So every new message gets added on to the end of this list as you type or when the AI returns a new message. We have a function which invokes the entire graph. So this is your input to the graph here. It will create the input state. So this is our message history, invoke the graph and then add a new message to that existing conversation history. I'm going to come back to the edges in a second, but we then build our nodes as well. So this is where we're calling our language model with our current message state. With our current message state, with the current time, the message history, and we're getting a response back, which we're adding to that message chain. We've also got our tool node. So these are the two nodes, the prompt node and the tool node, where we specify the three tools we need to use. This is a pre-built node that Langgraph provides, which makes it easier to build these tool nodes. And so it will execute these functions as provided by tool requests uh, in the format returned by a language model. We're using Langsmith here to make it easier and because then it will handle things like formatting those tool invocations for us. All we need to do to so that the language model is aware of the tools is do this bind tools. So now GPT-40 is aware of these, these three tools that it can choose to use at any point in time. Okay, so we've got our two nodes, the tool node and the prompt node where we're contacting our language model. Now we need to tie them together in the graph and with the edges. When we're building our graph, we have to tell Langgraph what structure we're going to be passing around. This is another pre-built component, but you can customize it in Langgraph. This message state just contains that message as object, so that after every node, a new message is added to that state, so the language model can make a decision when it is called. 
but you can add whatever you want to here. You could have multiple conversations going on between different agents, or you could have contextual information used to format the prompt. However you want to format this, it's, it's completely up to you. We now need to add the node. So we add our language model node, the agent, and our tool node where we can take action. And then we connect these with edges. There are two types of nodes, direct edges, which means it will always go to that node after. So that's what we're doing here when we're connecting the tool node back to the agent. It will, after it's used a tool, it will always go back to the, the agent node, the language model to see what its next step is. And then we've got a conditional edge, which says after, after we leave the agent node, we need to use this function should continue cooler. If should continue cooler returns continue, then go to the action node. And if it returns end, then end and finish the graph execution. So let's take a look at this should continue cooler function. It takes in the same message state, which is the current history of messages, has a look at the most recent message returned or added to that list and checks if there are any tool calls there that the agent, the AI language model wants to use. If there aren't any tool calls, then we're done. Return the last message to the user. If there are, then let's continue and go to the tool node. So that's what we're adding here with this conditional edge from the action back to the agent, from the tool node back to the agent. The last few things we need to do are just set the entry point. So we're starting at the agent and then compile it. And then we're good to use our invocation function here to run the graph end to end based on our new input message. And that's all there is to it. There's not a huge amount of code, but what I found the hardest in learning it was just conceptually getting my head around the nodes, the edges, the state and how it all works together. So I recommend having a look at Lang's graphs tutorials and having a read and really trying to get your head around it. Cause when it does, when it does click, it becomes a really powerful framework for building agent based systems. Right. Let's have another quick look at how it works. We can run it with streamlit run streamlit app. And then we get the same thing that we had before the chat on the left and our current state on the right. And it's being extra polite because I told it to. Telling it I'd like to book an appointment. It's got the next available one for me at 10.30. Great. So it's this is the tool message it's returned. And then it's formatted it a bit nicer by telling it's today and, you know, 10.30. Um, and so, yes, I'd like to book it. There we go. And it's booked the appointment for me, Will, at 10.30 today. And that's, that's great. That's exactly what we wanted it to do. Now we can cancel the appointment as well. Maybe I'll misspell it. And hopefully it should understand what's going on. And there it is, all cancelled. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, I wanted to share how... And that's it. Thanks for listening. If you like the video, then please hit like, subscribe. And if you'd like to see more of this type of content, more into Langraph, or there's something you particularly want me to build, you tell me, I'll build it, and we'll, we'll go through the code together. Thanks again. See you next week.